Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for attending the Mobile Gaming Research Lab lecture series. This talk is also sponsored by the North Carolina State University Department of Communication. My name is Adriana de Souza Silva. I'm a professor of communication at NC State University and the director of the Mobile Gaming Research Lab. The Mobile Gaming Research Lab supports interdisciplinary and interinstitutional research on all types of mobile games, including location-based mobile games, pervasive games, and augmented reality games. Housed in the Department of Communication, the Mobile Gaming Lab focuses on the study of all types of games that are portable and can be played while moving around. Obviously, the pervasiveness of mobile phones, which allow people to walk around spaces connected to both the internet and other people, strongly help the popularity of mobile games. But mobile games are much older than smartphones. We can trace back their origins to devices such as Mattel Auto Racer and Nintendo Game Boy in the 70s and 80s. Some of this history, as well as the theoretical implications of studying mobile games, will be discussed by our speaker today. Joining me in the organization of this event is Reagan glover Reitzi, a PhD candidate at the Communication, Rhetoric and Digital Media CRDM program at NC State University. Reagan will be responsible for taking questions from the audience and asking questions to the speaker after the talk. The format of the event will be as follows. After my introduction, I will play a pre-recorded 20-minute lecture by our speaker, Franz Myra, then we will open up for questions. If you would like to ask a question to Dr. Myra, please type your questions at the Q&A box. Questions from the audience will not be visible to attendees. Instead, they will go straight to the moderator, who will then ask questions to the speaker. I would also like to mention that if you're an undergraduate student at NC State Department of Communication who is attending the talk for credit in one of your classes, please send your name along with your instructor's name in a direct chat message to Mrs. Jody Waba. Please do that at the end of this event. Finally, I would like to introduce our guest, Dr. Franz Myra. Dr. Myra is Professor of Information Studies and Interactive Media at Tom Perry University, Finland. He studies the role of interactive media in culture and society, especially focusing on digital culture and game studies. Dr. Myra has done research on several aspects of gaming culture, including player experiences, the socioeconomic um, and social cultural analysis of games and experimental game design. And he has published numerous scientific articles and monographs related to interactive media and game studies. He has received various awards, including the Degra Distinguished Scholar Award in 2016 and is the founding director of the Academy of Finland funded Center of Excellence in Game Studies, as well as the head of Game Research Lab at Tampere University. Dr. Murray, welcome to our seminar. Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, short lecture titled uh, From Mobile Gaming Towards a Pervasive Culture of Play. Uh, my name is uh, Franz Maure. I'm speaking from Tampere, Finland. Okay, hopefully you are able to see my slides now. So uh, I'll start by a short introduction uh, into uh, the work and the uh, location where I'm coming from. Uh, so Tampere University Game Research Lab uh, was established officially in 2002, then it was a part of larger hypermedia laboratory. But it has background in humanities and digital culture studies in the Department of Literature and the Arts from early 1990s onwards. And the Game Lab here emerged as a uh, situated at the interstices of multiple disciplines and scholarly orientations. There are certain kind of fruitful tensions that it's good to notice. Uh, we had uh, both a powerful push towards this kind of humanities-based theory formation, wanted to understand the ontology of games and play, uh, but also the social sciences uh, context how to make our understanding of games accountable to the various societal contexts that are very important for uh, meaning making processes. And also there were uh, financial and other reasons that required a powerful link with industry. So design, innovation, research was something that, that we did indeed uh, do 
quite a lot early from early on. Uh, this triangle of research um, sort of captures our early understanding what game culture studies as we practice it here in Tampere means. So uh, we established a multidisciplinary teams. Uh, we had externally funded research projects and a research strategy that keeps the focus on current and future oriented phenomena. So for example, early on, we looked into multiplayer mobile games from turn of the century onwards, location aware gaming soon after that, pervasive games, social games, Facebook games, various kinds of emergent uh, phenomena. Uh, our aim uh, here in the uh, Game Research Lab is not actually focused on creating games, so we are not uh, that, that kind of lab, but we might need to create games in certain uh, research projects in order to study the potential of games or create game as a research instrument uh, for understanding culture, society, the future of playful media, etc. So in this triangle, we have this uh, humanities, uh, social sciences foundation that is then catalyzed and informed by various design research uh, perspectives and uh, understanding of players, their experiences, game cultures, and the meaning making is at the heart of this enterprise. Um, we have been experimenting and making various kind of innovations at uh, the borderlines of academic and artistic research. Uh, for example, we have experimented with playful cultural probes, uh, game-like uh, self-documentation sets. Uh, we have used uh, mobile text messages as a stimuli to participate uh, for engaging various uh, groups of people uh, into studies in their everyday situations. Uh, we have also carried out various live action role play experiments where the experimental play session can continue even for several weeks in uh, cases of pervasive play. Uh, then uh, we have also done collaborative design experimentations with uh, focused game jam um, as a tool to understand the creative processes, collaboration, the potential of games for various purposes. Here uh, you can see uh, some uh, work uh, in the area of hybrid playful experiences. Uh, so in this case, we are exploring the analytical and experimental creative studies into the expanding digital physical borderlines. So we are also <clears throat> setting up environments in our own laboratory uh, that are playful in character and embody not only uh, games, but various kind of ob objects and also design practices that uh, our uh, team of research assistants constantly is supervising and, and maintaining. Uh, I would say that uh, one thing that characterizes uh, our work is multiple perspectives, interdisciplinarity and, and multi-method, multidisciplinary research work. And it has its pluses and minuses. So our studies uh, typically uh, combine approaches to games and play that are drawn from sociology, media studies, human computer interaction, philosophy, design research, textual analysis of various kinds. So this kind of mixed approach is uh, good for grasping the complexity, the wide reach of phenomena uh, like uh, social games, multiplayer uh, situations, uh, games in Facebook and, and mobile games. However, it can also lead uh, to a certain fragmented view. Uh, this is not particularly conductive to providing a general theory that would organize uh, all this research into a unified whole. But it has strengths. Uh, it provides a very rich view. Uh, so, for example, when we studied Facebook games or social games, as they were called, the popularity and the limitations, we could explain uh, them with technical research. We uh, did some game usability uh, studies, uh, studies into distribution and marketing of these. Uh, we studied the psychology of uh, and play motivations, the commercial reasons, the business models, uh, also various cultural factors related to these games, so changes in games societal roles. And I have some references here 
and you can find more online. Um, what we of course have been thinking a lot is that what is actually the focus of study uh, in our game research lab? Is it games as certain kind of uh, designed objects, uh, artistic or entertainment creators, uh, creations or products? or play, which would expand the horizon. So uh, the rise of contemporary game studies, the sort of overshadow the important continuities in play studies, but uh, play phenomena are arguably uh, wider uh, than uh, m uh, games or, uh, or forms of play that are game specific. So when we are studying games, we are always also studying play and one could even argue that play is the more fundamental component here. You don't necessarily need a game to play. You can uh, play with um, uh, infinite potential uh, phenomena. And there's also this kind of deeper uh, theoretical ontological uh, consideration that uh, maybe play dry or playful mindset is uh, needed for uh, games to emerge uh, even as objects uh, of, of entertainment, art or, uh, or study. So uh, we can certainly uh, gamify or ludify wide range of different phenomena. And on terminology, by gamif gamifying I make, uh, I, I mean that when we are making something game-like, when I use ludify, I mean making playful, uh, referring here to Roger Kailua's ludus paidea axis more um, uh, specifically. But I also think that we need both directions. Uh, we need to look at games and we need to look at play and playfulness. Um, the field of games is arguably constantly expanding and, and transforming. So this is a, a sort of moving target. Uh, this morning when I checked mobygames.com, uh, it held details for uh, more than 247,000 digital games. And digital games are of course only a subset of, of uh, entire field of games. And they list uh, 287 different devices, technology, platforms and then regarding types of games, the uh, games that are set under different themes, they are organized into 57 categories in this uh, one website alone. And of course there's also an uh, infinite number of uh, indie games, experimental games, uh, games that are spontaneously set up. So uh, I would say that the field is pretty limitless. Uh, yet uh, uh, games as such is just a fraction of what play and playfulness is or can be. Here are a couple of uh, definitions. Uh, so uh, play uh, is the behavior spontaneous and rewarding of to the individual. It's intrinsically motivated. Its performance uh, is goal in itself. The behavior occurs in a protected context when the player is neither ill or stressed. The behavior is incomplete or exaggerated relative to non-play behavior in adults and it's uh, performed repeatedly. Uh, so this is coming from a page on a Martin Play Playfulness, Creativity and Innovation uh, book. Uh, but uh, this kind of perspective is a sort of behavioral science angle and founded uh, in work done by animal play scholars. And if we go to contemporary play scholars, uh, Michael Sicard in his uh, book, Play Matters, says uh, things like play is contextual, play is carnivalesque, play is appropriative in that it takes the context in which it exists and cannot be totally predetermined by such context. Play is necessarily disruptive of the order of context, play is autotelic, play is creative, play is personal. So in culture, play and playfulness can have a range of meanings and functions and uh, it expands the horizon in a slightly different direction as contrasted to the behavioral sciences understanding of what play is and what it means. Uh, another term that I want to discuss here briefly is ludification. 
uh, used Ryzen's uh, from Netherlands uh, in 2006 uh, discussed how culture is becoming more playful based on predominantly ludic ontology, as he says, which is uh, stimulated by digital technologies affiliation with playful goals and having consequences to construction of playful personal and cultural identities. Uh, myself with uh, uh, colleagues Jakos Terus, Marcos Montola have been uh, publishing and writing about the topic and what we have been emphasizing is the increasing playfulness in culture, how it can be detected in for example how games and game-like forms proliferate in public, how the ludic literacy and playful mindset become more common, arguably, and in how the changing norms and values uh, in uh, society become apparent in increasingly visible and pervasive play and playful practices. So this kind of uh, phenomena and developments, if they hold true, would be leading towards ludic society and culture, which uh, goes under the heading of ludification uh, broadly. Uh, so culture approaches to play are numerous. I just point here uh, to the uh, classics uh, like Johann Huizenga, uh, um, uh, has been highlighting uh, how play is a special form of activity, a significant form, and it's uh, somehow set apart. Uh, and this difference of play and everyday uh, from more utility oriented it, modes of being and acting, it's uh, certainly interesting, but it should be noted that it's not absolute, it's not watertight. Uh, utility and play, they certainly uh, mix, uh, work and play. Uh, do mix. Uh, but um, uh, analyzing this kind of distinctions is interesting for culture scholars in particularly. So uh, this difference is related to cultural categories, organization of our thinking and behaving, the underlying logic and foundation of our thinking and behaving in society. So uh, when we uh, like to uh, want to understand uh, the cultural uh, nature of play and games, we need to understand the organization of our cultural categories and uh, therefore uh, create this kind of uh, system of differences and similarities. So uh, in the uh, following uh, part of this short talk, I will very quickly uh, skim through various examples that I think that they are not typically discussed in game studies, yet I think that uh, they provide some kind of valuable perspectives and interesting uh, food for thought also people working in this field. So I want to first highlight uh, uh, imagination at uh, the roots of play. It is uh, very important to understand uh, that play is not created by presence of rules, for example, or artifacts of play. Uh, if you give a person a toy, it doesn't automatically create play. Uh, you need something else. You need this kind of mindset or, and understanding, this kind of cultural play and playful impulse. And in this, when you are entering a playful mode, you are experimenting, you are playing around, you are creating situations that alter our perspectives. For example, I have this personal example of playing LARP, live action role playing game for hours alone in a closed closet. Indeed that happened and it can be done. But uh, it is crucial to understand the social context, uh, the dominant uh, mode or mindset, which makes this kind of uh, phenomena uh, possible. Gregory Bateson is very influential in understanding and analyzing what he calls metacommunications, how there must be certain kind of hints uh, in this kind of play situations that guide everyone into playful interpretative frame regarding the actions and thoughts. And it's important to understand that in playful imaginative mode, alternative uh, the fictional perspectives are adopted as the primary ones. So you are engaging in certain kind of fantasy when you are playing. And this is an entire uh, research field of its own, of course. Uh, uh, there are this kind of interesting ambiguities regarding uh, fantasy. So it's uh, both 
are typically understood as something that is uh, dreamlike and, and hopeful, but it also has connections to delusions, figments of imaginations that can be even uh, be dangerous. So uh, they are uh, carnivalist, grotesque, uh, and other uh, traditions in uh, culture, this kind of um, uh, uh, impulse to profane and overturn uh, social order and hierarchies like Michel Partin has been analyzing. Uh, there are uh, various kinds of cultural uh, phenomena like uh, ghosts, vampires, and monsters that uh, are played with in this kind of imaginary realms. And uh, fantasy has, under analysis, uh, uh, proved to be this kind of dual phenomena that both affirms the normal world order by dramatizing its collapse and highlighting how important it is to understand the everyday reality, but it's also providing safe ways of exploring the disorder, the otherness, the unseen uh, outside of culture and society. And Bateson was discussing also this double, find, uh, double bind phenomena, very complex communication that can be also uh, creating various kinds of uh, difficulties. Uh, some artistic examples I just uh, highlight here, uh, Dada, uh, uh, the creative techniques that are like collage technique uh, uh, explained by Max Ernst, uh, systematic exploitation of the chance or artificially provoked confrontation of two or more mutually alien realities in an obviously inappropriate level. I uh, recommend uh, reading, for example, this Prager's Making an Art of Creativity, the Cognitive Science of Duchamp and Dada article, or looking into the exquisite corpse uh, uh, technique by surrealists uh, that is sort of method uh, based on collaborative writing, collaborative uh, art making. There are techniques like automatism, bulletism, and even entopic graphomania that are basically taking random elements uh, surrounding you in everyday reality and then opening up your sensitivity towards the playful possibilities of those. Situationists are uh, famous for doing various kinds of explorations into uh, surrounding everyday reality. So, uh, for example, um, Guy Deport has been, of course, writing a lot about the topic and he was uh, exploring psychogeographical research and experiments of uh, derive or drifting, construction of situations by making journeys out of the ordinary. So you could uh, explore uh, like streets of Paris like, like he did did in his work, The Naked City, uh, drawing this deliberately fragmented map of Paris uh, through subjective and temporal experiences of 19 sections of the city. And there are other interesting artists like Richard Long, Hamish Fulton, uh, that you can uh, study. For example, this work, A Line Made by Walking, where Richard Long was basically walking back and forth in a grassy field, making something that he, he felt an, uh, to be an artwork, and then taking a photograph uh, of, of the path that his uh, performance ha had uh, uh, carved into there. There are um, urban play and urban game forms that come closer to the phenomena that we are typically studying in game studies, but uh, often we ignore things like graffiti, uh, people engaging in parkour, for example. Uh, but uh, early uh, digital uh, hybrid uh, games, location-based games like Can You See Me Now? by Blast Theory and uh, Nottingham University. It is uh, an important uh, sort of exploration of this kind of uh, play potentials in uh, city streets. And there are other practices like urban exploration. Here are photos of people exploring uh, the nuclear uh, disaster site of Chernobyl. And uh, there are uh, sort of 
people who are deeply engaged uh, with uh, this kind of events, taking photographs and documenting them. But there are also uh, sites that of, of the uh, hobby and practice that are open for culture critique, uh, this kind of masculine, heroic explorer subject uh, emphasis, uh, able-bodied uh, people capable of uh, engaging the, in this and not uh, others. There are people who are making uh, very spectacular uh, play behaviors and practices in everyday uh, uh, places and situations like these uh, street art uh, pieces. And some uh, forms of, of street play are rather mundane, very accessible, and some are mixed with work and socializing. You are doodling while you are having a meeting or phone conversation. So uh, for us researchers, I will, uh, really just want to uh, say that it's a cultural political choice which areas of this wide uh, field we decide to highlight, where the focus. And I would also like to uh, uh, call for certain kind of back to the basics here that uh, there are all these interesting indie art and, and tradition uh, traditions of ludic behaviors, playful culture that are having lots of potential for rediscovery and further innovation. So uh, I would say that there are opportunities for further research in areas like uh, trying to create better understanding of how play situations operate. We need better understanding of what constitutes playful mindset to start with, and also uh, understanding of uh, the role of play in culture, uh, specifically and also more generally. So finally, uh, this is uh, what is ongoing now in uh, Tampere. Uh, uh, our Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies has been uh, operating a couple of years already, and. Uh, our aim in establishing this center has been to model the interconnectedness of games, uh, their uses, and the related structures of culture and society. And uh, for that, we need uh, strong expertise and uh, bringing together currently disconnected academic communities. And you can read more of that and our work in, uh, in the website uh, uh, link there. So. That's uh, the recorded part ending here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mara, for an insightful talk. Before we begin to move to our questions and answers, I just want to remind the undergraduate students in the NC State Department of Communication that if you'd like to be counted uh, for as present for this, for an assignment or extra credit, please send your name along with your instructor's name, the course title, and section number in a direct chat to Mrs. Jody Waba. At this point, I'd like to open if the audience has questions. You can start typing those questions in the Q&A box. Dr. Susie E. Silva and I have also prepared a couple of questions for Dr. Mara, and I'll try to alternate those with the audience's questions. So I'll go ahead and start. Uh, with a question. So you mentioned that play invites taking on alternative perspectives or safe ways of exploring otherness. How might play be used to facilitate thinking about issues that are important to our particular moment or within our society, for instance, considering perspectives that are not our own? Okay, that's an interesting question, certainly. So, um, Fictional and fantastic realms that uh, belong to at least certain kinds of games and play can provide uh, powerful experiences. They can certainly uh, even sometimes permanently uh, change the ways in which we uh, think about some things. Uh, and this is true of all forms of art, such as uh, cinema and literature as well. At the same time, uh, one needs to be aware that play experiences or uh, aesthetic experiences in art and entertainment more generally, they are not real life as we understand it in our everyday reality. And therefore there has been, for example, criticism about uh, certain kind of identity tourism, where one can safely explore identities, cultures, even tragic or violent experiences without uh, really uh, being put into the bodily oppressive or even dangerous realities that relate to the original domains of these playful explorations. So 
there are limits for transformation and learning that one can uh, derive from uh, games or simulations, if one uses that term. Yet when one approaches those with creativity and an open mind, I would say that one can indeed communicate, share and experience uh, something that has transformative potential in games and play. And uh, this uh, can also facilitate us to uh, change our ways of living and thinking in other non-games related areas of life. Thank you. So now we have a question from our audience. This is from Alex Kata, a CRDM student. She asks, considering the musical events being held in Fortnite, with the rest of the industry beginning to adopt these kinds of interactions such as Roblox, how do you see the nature of pervasive play and or the playful mindset changing? Well, I could um, start by connecting uh, that kind of practices with um, the ludification of culture, a ludic society and, and uh, a culture thesis that was uh, presented in my recorded uh, talk. So it is one sign, uh, I would say, that uh, it is an um, area of interest uh, and uh, sort of visible arena for uh, production of meaning and significance uh, when, for example, uh, other media forms uh, start to take notice and, uh, and also commercial operations are sort of state within uh, virtual realms of, of uh, games. So uh, regarding the pervasive play or playful mindset, uh, I, I think that uh, this is uh, one example of this kind of wider changes in uh, society, our uh, ways of thinking that uh, games are uh, becoming sort of uh, naturalized. Uh, they are not something that is uh, external to other uh, areas of life. Uh, there was talk about uh, digital natives and gamer generations at certain point and this kind of uh, deep divide set by certain certain thinkers that uh, there are people who sort of understand and do games and other people who are com completely sort of outside of these kind of practices. But I, I would say that uh, the boundary line is uh, sort of becoming more more shallow and permeable so uh, mainstream uh, news media can uh, write and, and publish stories about events that are taking place in these kind of virtual realms of games so uh, that's I, I think this kind of ongoing development Thank you. So the next question, which I think is a bit related. Um, so how do you think that play translates to this important component of our culture? You mentioned play often involves fantasy and imaginations, things that we typically dismiss as unimportant or at least not to be taken seriously. Um, but how do we move from this not serious perspective to something that actually has influence or importance within society? Thank you for the question. Um, I would say that there are interesting ambiguities, like Brian Southern Smith might call them, uh, related to play. Uh, play is simultaneously something that is uh, almost everywhere, yet it's uh, rather hard to define. If one looks at the elements of culture and society that have some kind of um, play elements empowering them, then it becomes soon obvious that play is immensely powerful element in society yet it's also something that is easy to uh, see as trivial it uh, might also be part of the power of play that it is non-threatening and non-serious as then it can uh, feel as liberating from the other serious or utilitarian areas of life so the full significance of play can perhaps uh, start to unravel from two directions uh, we can all engage in playful forms of culture and therefore accelerate the change of cultural norms and societal values that underline various hierarchies of power, uh, what we see and discuss as important or as trivial. Uh, the other direction um, might be coming from uh, research and increasing awareness and sensitivity towards the powers of play. When we become more aware of the multi-dimensionality of our lives, then we'll probably become more open towards the value of play too. So there's no longer a single truth, single hierarchy of value and power, but uh, 
multiple alternative ways of organizing our world and thinking. Really interesting insights. So our next question comes from the audience, Dr. Nicholas Taylor. He asks about the relationship between contemporary capitalism and the kinds of play that take place on commercial media devices and the economic and temporal and technological and social and so forth privileges often associated with sustained forms of play. Are there examples that the COE has identified of play that has the potential to transform, say, conditions of economic oppression? Mm. That's a rather difficult question, I, I would say. Uh, it is true that if we are thinking uh, of uh, commercial uh, game industry, for example, it has uh, its uh, own production logic and it's uh, often uh, related to, uh, for example, labor practices that uh, in some cases are not exactly sustainable, that uh, can be even seen see as uh, exploitative uh, towards the uh, sort of uh, precarious uh, young people that uh, form large parts of the workforce. And uh, then there's quite a lot of research that has been carried out also in our Center of Excellence regarding uh, playboard uh, phenomena, this kind of mixing of play and uh, volunteer work uh, by game players that, for example, produce mods, user-created uh, modifications that then uh, on the uh, basis of uh, end-user license agreements can be freely then uh, adopted and commercially exploited by the companies without uh, sort of providing any uh, uh, compensation for the original creators. So uh, there are uh, quite a lot of this kind of uh, power relationships and uh, dynamics, but the uh, field is changing uh, quite fast. And uh, in, I think in one month, we uh, will have a public uh, doctoral defense of researcher Heiki Tuni that is uh, focusing on uh, crowdfunding uh, in uh, game culture and, and game industry. And I would say that that's an interesting example of a, a study where the economic uh, sort of dynamics will be uh, unraveled in um, as this kind of multiple uh, interconnected networks of power, uh, of uh, support, enthusiasm, um, meaning making processes that are sometimes monetary, sometimes they are not monetary, but they are uh, related to cultural capital or passion or, or uh, some other factors. So I, I'm not really uh, capable right now of, of uh, thoroughly answering this question. Apologies for that. But I, I think that uh, there are certainly this kind of uh, ongoing uh, developments that are transforming the field. But I would say that we are moving not into this single direction of, for example, empowerment and liberation, but there are economically uh, sort of oppressive and exploitative dimensions uh, there intermixed as well. Thank you. So actually now we have two questions that have come up regarding the current moment, which is that of having this coronavirus, a global pandemic affecting our lives. And so to try to fuse these two questions, I'm curious, you know, there's been so much suffering and uncertainty that it's hard to think of like, you know, play being a part of our everyday lives these days. Um, in which ways can play and games help us in situations like these? Or how can they um, sort of become integrated in our day-to-day -day lives, particularly when we're stuck at home? Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. So, um, um, one thing that we are just doing uh, regarding uh, this uh, topic is that uh, we are finalizing a research report uh, on the new edition of uh, what is called Finnish Player Barometer. So it's a, a long-term nationally representative survey into games and play in Finland. And this time uh, our data set is particularly interesting because uh, the survey responses, we got over 900 of them, were collected in April and May when the pandemic and isolation measures were active in Finland and elsewhere. Uh, the final conclusions from this survey research are yet to be written, but it uh, already 
obvious uh, that people were playing more during the pandemic than in times of our earlier surveys. And when we look deeper, we can see that partly this is reported as uh, something that was done just to pass time when no other activities were available. Teenagers reported uh, that their game playing uh, times were particularly high uh, during uh, this time. On the other hand, we were also witnessing middle-aged people and parents reporting playing more and also families playing more together. So there are certainly multiple sides into this. So people uh, obviously have need for escape. And they also had in times like this, uh, they need a place for recovery and uh, some kind of uh, areas that uh, are restorative for their mental health and, and energies, place for having fun and keeping playful contact also with their uh, friends and family. And for some people, the daily sessions of playing an online multiplayer game might be uh, at these times the only human contacts uh, they had uh, uh, with other people and uh, while living in isolation. So play and games, they can certainly serve multiple needs in these exceptional times and, um, and it can be also be seen from their popularity if we are looking at the statistics. Thank you. So we have another question from the audience. This one from Chris Paul, who writes, how do you think that this conception of play changes the notion of how we think about gamers or players? Can it be a way to disinter traditional expectations of the market? Hmm. Thinking about gamers or players. Well, I, I think that um, in a certain way, uh, if we take this kind of very uh, sort of broad ranging interpretation of uh, play and playfulness and sort of start equating it with uh, sort of creative capacity or alternative perspective, or even with uh, like imagination or fantasy becomes uh, the root of play, then uh, who is actually a player or gamer from uh, that perspective, I would say that it uh, at least should encourage us to sort of reconsider our stereotypical understanding of um, of players as people who are uh, uh, deeply engaged with only this kind of tip of the iceberg style of uh, of very uh, high octane um, uh, sort of. Um, uh, visible commercially produced uh, uh, game forms, action, action games or, or game products of that uh, kind. I, and I think that this kind of extended and expanded conception of play uh, should encourage us to uh, sort of see the player in different uh, eyes that uh, we can look everybody and sort of uh, find alternative interpretations, what it means to be a player. And also uh, from that starting point, then we might start to uh, start reconsidering what games are and also what is our conception of the archetypal game that is sort of guiding our understanding of what is the proper domain where scholars of game studies are working with. Okay, so one related question that I think we might look to is you mentioned that play is not bound by rules, but rather games and that it allows for spontaneity, spontaneity imagination and fantasy. On the other hand, games with rules, what can we learn from these rules of the game? What do rules lead to? Do they take the values away from play, for instance? Well, rules are certainly very interesting, both regarding games as designed creations and forms of play as emergent practices. From this kind of more design research angle, successful game rules, they need to satisfy multiple criteria or they will not work. Nobody will play them or, or in, enjoy them. For example, rules can be too complex. Uh, they can be non-optimal regarding the target audience or they can have different kinds of blind spots 
uh, which players then can perhaps also fill in with their own house rules, uh, particularly if we are talking about uh, this kind of very simple games, uh, classic board games, example, then house rules are natural part of, of interpreting the designed rules. There are also many interesting studies which have looked games from uh, this kind of counterplay angle. Uh, there's always certain application of power involved in rules and players may submit to those rules, but they also may engage with a struggle with the rules. Uh, such uh, rules can give birth to play that goes along the built-in script or of game design, but equally it can provoke counter reactions or just stimulate explorations into alternative emergent forms of play. So there can also be multiple motivations underlying both the ways in how games and their rules are designed and in how different kinds of people decide to play along or against or alongside those rules. As such, I think that rules are certainly one dimension that one can use to study also the values and norms that you mentioned as they are involved in the design of games as well as in various play forms. Okay, so next we have a question from Gaius, a student in the CRDM PhD program. Gaius writes, thank you for your talk, Dr. Myra. I was just curious about the idea of the double bind that you take from Gregory Bateson's work, which for Bateson emerges from the complexity of schizophrenia and inability to make decisions. How do you think gameplay, as we understand it today, negotiates these complexities in our lives? Thank you. Well, uh, I, I was basically uh, thinking about uh, the basic gameplay situation as a certain kind of uh, double bind situation that uh, when we are uh, adopting the posi position of uh, playing a game, uh, one can also say that the game starts to play us, that uh, it, it is a requirement for our role as a player uh, to follow the rules or otherwise we are not player of that particular game as it, as it was designed. So there is certain kind of uh, informs, uh, enforced uh, and, and uh, sort of uh, um, uh, subjected uh, dimension of uh, player position. But at the same time, uh, it is also a position of, uh, of freedom from other uh, rules of everyday reality. So uh, I can see that uh, people might be, for example, locked into this kind of uh, almost compulsive um, practices of uh, playing. They might be repeatedly playing the same game again, again and again, or uh, just uh, passing their time by uh, using uh, like slot machines or playing a, a game of solitaire day after day. And uh, it is, uh, um, I, I would say that there is this kind of element of uh, mental coping that is at the same time pos potentially also uh, keeping uh, the problem unsolved because uh, you are engaged in activity. So you are feeling that you are doing something, but at the same time, you are not actually solving the roots, uh, root, roots of your problems, but you are locked in uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, secondary uh, uh, dimension where you are uh, possibly uh, working out uh, room for, your, uh, for yourself to cope with uh, life problems or, or uh, other challenges of, uh, of your life. So uh, games have this kind of uh, curious, like I said, uh, referring to Brian Sutter Smith, ambiguity in them that uh, they can be both empowering and liberating and they are certainly uh, escapist in a certain sense, they can take you away from uh, some bad place where you uh, you are sort of uh, threatened constantly. But at the same time, uh, that is uh, an ambiguous escape because uh, they can also just maintain the status quo of, of your everyday life. But um, regarding the mental health uh, uh, areas, I 
uh, I just uh, refer to my colleagues who are currently uh, working with uh, uh, some student organizations with mental health of students and um, a role of play in this area. And I think that one of the lessons that they have already derived is that when you combine play with uh, other support uh, uh, sort of dimensions and uh, rather than uh, looking at solitary play uh, practices, you are looking at uh, social uh, play events and uh, this kind of uh, social support where play uh, is a conduit for connecting with other people, then you can probably find a way out of this kind of nasty double bind uh, sort of lockups. Thank you. So one of the things that I kept thinking about is you mentioned, you know, play can be a form of like escapism, a sort of a temporary escape from everyday life. Um, but Charles Walker writes uh, here in the comments, what can you say about cultural trends about who is allowed to play certain games when it comes to issues like race and gender? Have you seen positive changes or are there areas we need to do more work on how we think about the people who can or cannot participate in games and play play culture? That is one of the really hard questions of, of uh, game culture, uh, that uh, it is uh, so segregated and that uh, looking, for example, into this uh, Finnish player parameter data, we are uh, asking uh, people about the games that they are currently playing. And when you uh, then cross-reference that in terms of uh, uh, gender and age, you can see that there are very strong uh, clusters where, for example, um, uh, act action games, shooter games, uh, uh, com complex uh, uh, competitive games, they dominate uh, young uh, men's uh, um, sort of favorite lists. And uh, then you have uh, other genres, uh, simulation and, and uh, this kind of problem solving uh, uh, so social games that are uh, certain forms of mobile games that are uh, sort of more uh, domi dominated or more equal in terms of uh, gender or, or uh, which have uh, more female players. Then we have uh, other areas of game culture where uh, the dynamics of, of uh, development of uh, uh, game design practices and play practices has evolved in different routes as contrasted to commercial game development. And one field where our research have, have been really working on is the Nordic live action role playing scene where uh, female participation and participation by uh, 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 gender minorities and, uh, and uh, alternative uh, perspectives is much stronger than uh, what I think is in commercial uh, digital uh, games currently. And I think that it's uh, uh, really interesting to and really, really important for us scholars working in this field to highlight uh, the alternatives in um, uh, practices of designing games, uh, highlight games that are dealing with difficult issues uh, and that are not taking the easy stereotypical commercial route, but are actually uh, also, also dealing with something that can feel uh, problematic or even threatening by certain audiences, but uh, then also also uh, listen to uh, people who are actually developing those and playing those games in order to understand what they mean for these people who are engaged with this uh, uh, form of culture. And uh, then I think that uh, at, at least uh, I've seen uh, anecdotal evidence of people working with game research and working with this kind of uh, non-commercial productions, taking some of those ideas also into these uh, commercial domains and uh, trying to influence the mainstream of uh, game design and, and um, uh, practices. So I think that there are uh, certainly uh, some signs of hope, so to speak, of, of the field becoming more diverse. Thank you. So I think we only have time for one more question. And I think we can leave with a question that kind of gives us a direction for future work. So you state in your lecture that play has multiple meanings and encapsulates a wide range of activities. For this reason, deciding what to study is a political choice. 
How might we begin to make such choices? What frameworks do you use to determine your objects or areas of study? Yes, uh, well, uh, first of all, um, I, I have the luxury of working with uh, excellent colleagues in our uh, research center uh, and the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. We have uh, multiple research groups. We have tens of researchers collaborating in uh, studying different topics. So there's quite a lot of uh, diversity also in terms of knowledge, interests and motivations that are driving uh, our, our work. And if I look then also at the work that has been uh, carried uh, in our carried out in our game research lab uh, in Tampere during the last uh, 20 years or so, there has been certain changes. At the early stage, we wanted to learn more about the fundamental character of games and play as objects of study. We were also interested in the future oriented forms of games, exploring emergent platforms, technologies, such as mobile media, online play, multiplayer interaction, location, place, uh, based play, social media, gaming. And in this stage, our uh, sort of research agenda and motivations could be described as descriptive and exploratory. Our view of play and players was collaborative. And most of us researchers also self-identified as gamers or game players of some kind. And we wanted to make positive contributions to the ways in which games were developed. Then uh, more recently, the politically engaged character of our work has taken new forms. As well, everybody knows the societal and cultural context has changed. And uh, there's both an increasing demand for certain kinds of play in applications that go outside of so-called classic games, for example, in what is called gamification. And also um, there are more aggravated forms of negative aspects of game culture, such as discrimination, harassment, hate speech, racism and sexism. They have all directed our attention towards a more inclusive and socially engaged forms of activity. And I personally think that the framework uh, developed by our center of excellence is, is nice because it's in serious that we'll aim at a very multidimensional and complex picture of uh, games and playing culture. So that at, at least is some sort of uh, guarantee to uh, sort of determine that our objects are important. And we are also listening to uh, quite a lot of different stakeholder groups, and that is an important feedback for our work. Well, thank you so much. I think that we are actually out of time, but I would like to remind before we leave the undergraduate students in the Department of Communication that if you want to be counted present in the event, please respond privately to Dr. or Mrs. Waba's message in the chat before the end of the event. Please send your name along with your instructor's name and course section. And on behalf of the Mobile Gaming Research Lab and the NC State Department of Communication, I just want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. And for those who are interested, we will have a recording of the event that will be available on the Mobile Gaming Research Lab's website. So thank you, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you, and I really appreciate given the fact that it's so late there in Finland right now. <laughs> Yeah, I have my sauna hot, so I will have a proper uh, end of the evening, but have a very nice day there. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you.